Okay, so today we're going to continue our kind of special topics uh, coverage that we've been uh, going through. Uh, last time we did that Blocks World uh, program, today we're going to do air handling uh, in and exceptions as a specific way of doing the air handling. Uh, this shouldn't take too long. We've only got a little bit of stuff to get through here, but this is something that can be really important, uh, especially as you try to make a real uh, application uh, that is reliable. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first part of this uh, you'll notice is that, and I'm sure everybody has run into this while you've been programming your assignments, is that when you write a Python program and you have some sort of a, uh, a problem in your code, the program, when the Python interpreter run in, runs into that error, it'll kind of halt the execution and display kind of that error message, which is called the traceback. And I'm certain you've seen things like that. Like here's some example code that I read. It's like basically says uh, C equal A plus B. And you'll notice that I had a capital B instead of a lowercase. I hadn't had that defined in my code. And so what you end up with is this error message that shows up during execution. And the error message, the, the traceback shows you what line the error happened on. It shows you the text of the line and it'll tell you what kind of error it is. So name error. In other words, a name error was it couldn't find variable B. I tried to access some variable that Python didn't know about. It didn't exist from its point of view. And so it'll just halt the execution of the program. Now, a traceback is uh, kind of what Python does, what the Python interpreter does when there's some sort of error in the code that isn't handled in some way or isn't handled by the code in some way. In other words, the interpreter says, something bad happened. I'm going to stop and tell you about where it happened and what I think it was uh, that caused that to happen. All right, now, one of the things uh, that we have is that sometimes those uh, errors can be caused by bad programming or uh, incorrect programming. And so uh, you might have a typo in your code, like I did in the previous example. You might have some sort of logic error where you go off the end of some sort of a list. Uh, you might have some kind of error where you access a variable inside of a a function and it's global but you didn't declare it global and you tried to change it so there are all kinds of things that can do that but that's usually caused by some sort of uh, bad programming but there are other errors that aren't caused by bad programming necessarily they're caused by something unexpected happening or something exceptional happening not meaning exceptional meaning good but exceptional meaning it's an exception it's something that doesn't happen all the time uh, and the the former the first of those we can fix those by debugging our code, by fixing them. So if we have a, a program and we use the wrong variable name, we can fix that. If we accessed a variable before we declared it, we can fix that. So we should fix those. The programmer should fix those. But the second case are a little more insidious because they're things that can happen that we didn't cause by the way we wrote the code. It's being caused by some outside influence on the code. So it's with the data that's being provided to the program or the data that the program loaded from a file or the data that was put in by a user. So let's look at a quick example uh, of what we're talking about here. So here's some example code. It's really simple. We basically say get uh, a number or enter a value. We type in a value, enter another value. We type in another value. And then we take the result uh, and compute that as the first value multiplied by the second one. And then we print out this message that says, the first value times the second value equals and then some result. So this is a simple program that's supposed to multiply. And you'll notice that in this code, the first thing we'll notice is if I run this, I type in 10 and 20, it gives me a traceback immediately. And it'll say can't multiply sequence by non int or by non int of type string. So the problem here is the input doesn't return a number, it returns the string of characters that was input. So one zero is different than the number 10. 10 is the string 10, where 10 is the number 10. So that we're using kind of the wrong type uh, there. So in other words, we're trying to do multiply on two things that are not numbers. You can't take a string and multiply it by a string. And that's notice the error it has is a type error, it's saying we can't multiply these types of things. It doesn't make sense. Multiply works on numbers, not on strings and other strings. So that creates a problem for us. Now. And that's a logic error. So that's something that we did wrong in our program. Now, we can certainly fix that, and that's easy to fix. We just convert the two numbers to floats when we do the multiply. And now when we put in the two values, we get 10 times 20 equals 200. Now, everything seems good now. 
uh, at least from our perspective. But there's another problem that we're kind of hiding here, and that is that we're relying on the user to input data. And so what if the user inputs something that is not a number, it can't be converted to a number by float? So that creates this other uh, problem. So the problem that we have is that we're relying on a user to input data, but we're relying on them to input it as an actual number, something that could be converted into a number. So here, what if the user uh, puts in something very strange? So in this case, it's an enter value, and they type out the number 10, T-E-N, and they put 20. Now, the float conversion cannot take a string T-E-N and convert it into uh, the number 10 because it doesn't know how to do that. It only can convert digits, sequences of digits into numbers. And so notice that we get another error. But notice the type of error is different. Now it's a value error. So in other words, the type of what we passed into float was okay. It's designed to take strings. But the value of that string that we passed in was something that could not be converted to a number. So it has this error that happens where it says float cannot convert a string to float when we have the string 10. If we had the string 1, 0, it could work, but not the string 10. So that's a value error. So now the user has crashed our program by putting in something unexpected or something that we didn't think about them doing. So the question is, what can we do about that? We don't want necessarily bad data to completely crash our program. We don't want somebody to uh, run our program, type something in accidentally wrong, the whole program crashes. We want it to be a little more robust than that, a little more reliable than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a way of uh, handling that. So we can't control the user. We could tell them what to put in. But we can't really control them. They're going to put in whatever they put in. Uh, and we also couldn't control the contents of files that we try to load, or if a drive fills up and we're trying to write to it, or the internet goes down and we're trying to get data from it. So the question is, how do we handle problems like that that our code can be in a, get itself in a situation where it's not fully responsible for that? So for example, I'm asking a user to input data. The program, the computer can't go out and make the user do the right thing. Or the user might just have an accident or be confused. Uh, they might accidentally hit enter before they meant to. So those are the kind of things that we want to handle with this. So what we want to do is how do we handle those kind of unforeseen circumstances? We're going to write our programs in such a way that the program can handle uh, the errors on its own. And that method is called exception handling. In other words, we have this exceptional uh, error thing that happened, this error that happened, we want the code to be able to say, oh, an error happened, I'm going to do something about it, rather than passing it to the Python interpreter to just crash and show us a message. So that's going to allow us to write programs that do something other than just crash and stop. Now, in order to do that, though, uh, we have to use that on the right type of errors. And what does that mean, the right type of errors? Well, so in other words, this exception handling isn't a, a, a panacea for all kinds of errors. So for example, if we divide errors up into different kinds of categories, we have syntax here. In other words, we use the language wrong. For example, we have an open parenthesis but don't have a close, or we have a, uh, a string that we opened and we don't close it, or we put uh, some kind of construct together with uh, a list of things, but we have a comma where a comma shouldn't be or something like that. So those are syntax errors. Those are errors with how we're using the language itself. Now, the second type of error are logical errors. And those are kind of errors in our thinking or our algorithm or our implementation of an algorithm or our way of going about solving the problem. So those kinds of errors would be maybe the program would run fine, but would give a wrong answer. Or it might be the program, uh, the ideas correct, but we left off some edge case and we walk off the end of an array sometimes, but only in certain cases. So those are errors in the way we wrote the code and the way we thought about the problem. And exceptions, kind of the third category there, that's where some bad thing happens uh, while the program was running, usually caused by something out of its control, like reading input or reading a file or accessing a resource uh, like the internet. And the cause of those kinds of errors, the thing that usually causes those kinds of errors, are usually uh, exceptional circumstances. A drive fills up, or uh, the file that we tried to open doesn't exist anymore because somebody moved it, 
We tried to open a file for writing and the file was on a network share that we don't have write access to. Or it, we asked a user to input something and they typed it in wrong. So those kinds of things are what we're talking about. So error handling can't really do much about the top two types. So syntax error, that's your fault for using the language wrong. It's not going to fix that. Uh, logical errors, it's not going to go in and like change the way that your program works because you were stupid about the way that you wrote it. Uh, but what it can do is handle those exception types. So now, error handling can catch the other two types of errors, but it won't do any good because if the code has a syntax error or an algorithm has a logic error, catching that error might allow us to catch that and put something in a log file, but it's not going to fix it. There's no way we can recover from those other two because it's just the program is bad. But the third type, we could pop up an error message saying the drive is full or you didn't put in the right thing that I, you didn't put in what I asked you to put in or uh, the network is currently down. Do you want to try again or do you want to cancel this operation? So those kinds of things uh, with exceptions, we can write our code so that it does something about that. But adding uh, error handling around a syntax error, you're just always going to have that error happen. It's never going to fix that. Same thing with logic errors. Okay. Now, along those lines, uh, and the, those types of programs. It's our job as programmers to fix the first two kinds of errors. If we have a syntax error in our code, we should fix it. If we have a logic error in our algorithm, we should debug that, figure out what's wrong with it, and fix that, or use a different algorithm um, to solve that problem. But we can't control, as programmers, what a user does or what comes in from those outside uh, files and devices. So it's our job to not necessarily uh, make sure that the, all that works because there's no way to do that. There's no way to make sure that the drive is never going to fill up or the user's always going to type the thing that we want in the right format that we want. So our job as programmers would be to write the code in a way that it handles those exceptions in some way that deals with that. So if we deal with that, though, if we write our own exception handling, that's going to allow the program to more gracefully handle those errors rather than just crashing. Uh, and here's a real-world example of that. Um, I, I once had this uh, installation for, uh, and this, this is years ago now, for Windows 95, and it came on three and a half inch floppy disks. And there was something like 30 something of these little three and a half inch floppy disks. And you had to install the operating system by putting in disk one, and then it would run for a while. And then you put in disk two, and it would run for a while. And I was installing it on this laptop that only had a floppy drive on it, it didn't have a, uh, a, a CD drive or uh, even a way to add it through flash drives weren't commonly available then. And so I got to the final disk of the set and the disk had an error. And rather than the program handling it gracefully and allowing me to retry or do something about it, it just crashed and it said, uh, basically, it failed to install and you got to start over again. And so this is this long process of going through all this. Just so ideally, we don't want to have some program that somebody makes a typo like imagine you're using Microsoft Word or Excel and you accidentally hit a wrong key somewhere when you're typing something into a box and the whole thing crashes and you lose all your work. We don't want that. We want to handle those kinds of things gracefully. We try to access a file that doesn't exist. It tells us that file doesn't exist and lets us recover from that through using the program rather than it just completely crashing the program. So that's what we're talking about doing here is we don't want to waste people's time on having the program crash. All right. Now, kind of moving ahead uh, here is to add exceptional handling in Python, we're going to use this new language construct. And this language construct exists in other languages as well. Uh, so if you learn how it works in Python, then you can also use it in languages like Java and C++ and some other uh, languages that have this. It's a very common way to handle it. But the idea is that we have this new construct. And we have the keyword try. And then in Python, we have a colon, and then indented underneath that, we have some lines of code. And then we have this other section, except with a colon, and then things indented underneath that. So the idea is anything between the try and accept, we're going to run those lines of code. And if it, an exception happens, then it's immediately going to jump down to this accept block and then handle that exception. So in other words, try these lines of code. If something goes wrong with that, jump to the accept block and then execute those lines of code when the exception happens. So in other words, that allows us to wrap any kind of dangerous lines of code or anything where we're relying on user input or a file to be open. It allows us to wrap them inside of this kind of construct that can catch when an error happens. 
Now the accept block of code can kind of then handle the error or print out a message or log the error. But the program in this case isn't going to crash and stop because we've caught that error and done something about it. Now we don't have to do anything complex about it in order to prevent it, the program from crashing and stopping. We just have to have an accept that handles it. But we probably should do something about it. Otherwise, the error could happen again and again. So we should at least have some sort of message or some sort of logging uh, that happens to do that. Now, with exception handling, uh, if we don't handle an exception, it gets passed upwards. And if it makes it up all the way to the Python interpreter's default exception handler, that's what prints out the trace back and stops the program. So in other words, the Python interpreter has this built-in exception handling capability that essentially just says, here's the error, here's where it was, here's what I think the type of error was. And that's kind of its built-in way of handling, but it also halts the program when that happens. So let's go back to that program we had earlier that allowed the error. Remember the one where they typed in TEN instead of the number 10? And let's actually see if we can fix that with some exception handling. All right, so there's the code that we had. We just blindly said, take whatever they typed, try to convert it to a float. And if that fails, then it crashes the program because there was no exception handling around that. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of exception handling. So num1 gets entered, num2 gets entered, so those are both strings. And then we convert them to floats. Now, if they can't get converted to floats, that normally would have thrown that error like we had before. But now, since it's in a try block, it's not going to crash the program. It's going to jump down and hand, hit this exception when they do something bad. So in this case, I just print out a little error message. I say they're a bad user for doing that. And that's uh, essentially going to give us the uh, result that we want, in this case, uh, not crashing the program. But even though that program won't crash, notice that we didn't get the numbers multiplied by each other. So we might have to restart the whole thing in order for it to work uh, correctly the second time. And so one of the things that we want to do uh, to fix that is, is there a way we could restructure this code so we guard each input separately and we only allow them to go on once they have it? And the answer is yes. And so here's a method of doing that. So notice the way that this works is uh, I've kind of condensed the code a little bit. I have a while loop that will run forever, while true. So the only way out of this loop is if we had a break statement. And we do have a break statement in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say try to get num1 and set it equal to the float conversion of whatever they typed in here. Now, if they type something that can't be converted to a float, this is going to throw an error and immediately jump down here and say, that's not a valid number. Uh, type again or try again. So type that again. And then it will jump up and ask them to enter a value again up here. So the only way I'll ever get to this break statement is if I get past this assignment without having an exception being erased or an error happening. And so this is actually a pretty common design pattern that you'll see that anytime you want to guard some kind of input that we essentially lock them in here until they give us a value that is not an error, until we get a condition that's not an error. And in that case, we can jump down. Once we finish this, we jump down and do the same thing with num2. And now down here, notice I don't have this inside of a try block anymore uh, with num1 and num2 in this line down here. And the reason that I don't have it in that result line is because now I know for a fact that I was able to convert those to floats. I don't need to have this in a try block because I know that's a float. And that's a float, so I don't need to have, I know this will work and will be able to give me the result. Okay, so there's uh, kind of exception handling. Now there's a couple more uh, things that we can do is we can say what kind of errors we want to catch. So right now, let me go back for just one second here. So going back, you'll notice that this is going to catch, if I just have a blind try except block, except will catch any kind of error that might happen in here, any type. So except with nothing after it will accept, will catch all error types that could happen. But notice if I only want to catch the value errors and allow other kinds of errors to go through, like uh, maybe control C to break, interrupt the program from running, on this side, I don't want to run this anymore, Control C, get out of that. We don't want to be stuck in this forever if we don't want to be. So notice I can specify the type of exception that I want to uh, catch here, the type of error I want to catch. So this is only going to allow or catch the errors that are value errors, which is the type that we would get by having typing in a wrong value. But this would pass other kinds of errors along and upwards, just like uh, if we didn't have any accepting error exception block at all on this. So... 
The accept block will only catch the type of error specified if we leave that off, uh, like we did uh, in the example earlier, like back here, then it'll catch all of them. This will only catch the type of error that we specify. Now, you can actually specify more than one type of error if you want. So for example, I could say catch all value error type errors. And the way we do that is we make a tuple that lists out all of the types of errors that we want to catch here. So we could list as many types of errors as we want. And in fact, uh, we could have separate accept blocks to handle them in different ways. So one, I could print out a different error message, bad type here, not a valid number. Uh, and notice in this case, what I did in the bottom case is, oops, let me go back. Notice what I did is I break if it's a bad type, but I make them try again if it's the wrong number. And so you don't have to handle these just by different print messages. You can actually take different actions entirely based on the type of error uh, that was encountered. And you can have as many of these accept blocks as you want. Uh, and it'll basically go through these one at a time, finding the one that matches. Uh, and there will only really be one that matches that as we run down through the list. And whichever one matches first, that's the one that's going to be uh, reported. All right, now, also uh, exceptions have the ability, or these try blocks have the ability to have this else added on to the end of it. So notice we can say try this, except if we, this error happens, except if this error happens. Otherwise, we do that. So this code here will only run if there were no errors. So this is kind of like a, uh, a way to say only execute this if everything was fine in this and there were no errors. So that's a, a easy way to make sure that we got through the code uh, and got through without any errors. And in some cases, you might even see uh, something relatively simple here. Like, for example, this would be getting the number uh, and then do something with the number down here. We don't want to do something with the number after this unless we got the number without any errors. So we can put that in the else block of that. And so again, the usefulness of that is having that code in the else block only run if there were no, if the exceptions in the accept block, accept list, uh, did not happen. Okay, finally, uh, one last thing with this error handling, and then we'll be done. I said this would be a relatively short uh, lecture today. But the last thing is you can actually have the error handling uh, system itself give you uh, the, a description of that error, kind of like Python did when it printed out the message on the screen when it had the traceback. We can actually, rather than having to write those all ourselves, we could just use them. So notice that uh, in this case, I have them try to input the thing. If they input it wrong, then the way I get access to that error message is I just say as error. And so what that does, if now if I print that error out, that's a string. So in other words, I'm going to accept, I'm going to get the value error, and then I'm also going to get the description that went along with that. And you can use this on any error type. You could use this uh, on just generic exception errors, uh, meaning any error. And I could get one of those and get the description that was associated with that and then print that out or log it or do something with it. And one of the cases where I've used this a lot is when you have some sort of a, a program that's running, you want to have it log the output, have a log file. And in that log file, anytime there's an exception, push that to the log file, even if you continue on. And that way you can look at the log file and see what went wrong and look at the description of what went wrong uh, rather than having the log file just say something or having to type out all those ourselves in our error message and write it to the file, we can get that string that has the error kind of description right in it directly. So very useful to have that. Okay, now some of the common exception types that you might want to uh, deal with in your code somewhere. Uh, for example, you have um, exception, uh, which is, notice these are all capitalized. But if it's an exception type error, that will catch all exceptions. In other words, that's the same as just having an accept colon. If you say accept exception colon, then that will catch all exceptions. Now, we have runtime errors. Uh, those are errors that generally don't fit other categories. Uh, the cat is here, so just be aware that I might be attacked any moment. Um, but the... Uh, runtime errors are kind of errors that don't fit any other category. A syntax error is what we talked about earlier, something wrong with the code uh, that was written. Uh, type error, we saw those earlier. Uh, that means we're trying to use the wrong type for some operation, like a string for multiply. 
value error means that it's a right type, but the value in it was unable to be used in the way that we intended, like trying to convert ten into a value one zero doesn't work. Uh, zero division is one that you might need to catch sometimes where you have some sort of mathematical operation that's being performed and it's possible that you could divide by zero in some cases. Uh, something like a, a, trying to normalize a vector of length zero. You try to divide it by the length that has no length. It'll crash the program unless we catch that in some way and do something about it. So zero division error. Name error means we tried to access a variable that doesn't exist. Uh, that's usually uh, some sort of logic error or a typo in our program, but we can catch those. Uh, IO error means we tried to open a file or some other device and it was unavailable. Index error means we went off the end of an array, off the beginning, off the end, we tried to access something. Uh, similar uh, and related to that is a key error, meaning we tried a dictionary, we tried to look something up in the dictionary, and the thing we tried to look up doesn't exist in there. Uh, a dictionary being kind of an associative array uh, key value storage system, we tried to say, hey, uh, for example, look up in the phone book uh, this name that's not in the phone book, and it will give us an exception uh, rather than crashing the program, saying that's not in there. Uh, so that, that can be a useful one. Uh, import error, uh, we tried to import some module, and it had a problem. There's also a related one, that module not found error. That's different. That's We tried to import something that didn't exist rather than we tried to import something and it failed to import. And then the last one that I've used uh, on some programs is this keyboard exception or keyboard interrupt. If you press control C while a program is running and it's in a loop, the keyboard interrupt can be a way to catch that and cause the program to stop. So for example, you could write, a, let's say, a um, something like a program that's going to run for a really long time and to go through some iterative process. And when you want to stop it and then continue on to the next step, press control C uh, to bypass that or get out of that. And the program will catch that and you can handle that and then continue or handle that out and ask them, are you sure you want to stop? And then if they say yes, then exit the program. Now for a complete list of those built-in exceptions, I put a little link here uh, to uh, the Python 3 documentation um, at python.org that has a list of all the built-in exceptions. There's one other thing you can do where you can raise your own exceptions using a, a there's a way to, to raise a particular error that you define yourself. Uh, that can be useful. Uh, I didn't cover that here today, uh, but you can make it so you raise your own exceptions and have your code catch those as well. And so I'd recommend looking at this exception page and looking up how to do that. That can be a really useful thing. Now, one question that comes up is when do we want to use one of these try accept blocks? So the idea is we don't want to put it around every piece of code because, again, we should fix our own uh, syntax errors, we should fix our own logic errors. Putting a try accept block around a logic error is not going to do any good to fix it. It might catch it and keep the program from crashing completely, but the logic error is just never going to allow the program to run correctly in whatever situation caused it to get into that logic error. So the places you want to use a try accept block is usually where any outside force uh, or outside data could cause some kind of problem in our code. Okay, the cat is hitting me. Hold on, go away. So cases where the outside forces uh, can cause those errors, uh, anywhere you get input from a user, anywhere you try to open a file to read things from it or write things to it, anywhere you're reading to a, from a file or writing things to a file where the file could suddenly get deleted or uh, become unavailable or the drive could fill up, uh, something like that. Uh, anything where you're parsing data from a file that you came from an outside location where somebody could have edited it and changed it or messed it up or corrupted it in some way. Um, also, any kind of network I.O. where you're reading or writing uh, to a network resource. And also, uh, I didn't mention them on the list of exceptions back here, but there are exceptions for memory allocation error. So if you try to allocate a really large amount of memory and the computer just ran out of memory and doesn't have any memory to give you anymore, there's an exception that happens when you try to, for example, add more things to a list once memory runs out. And in a lot of cases, there might be something you could do about that. You're out of memory. Rather than crashing the program, maybe tell the per program or the, or the user that you're out of memory so they can close another application. And then also the keyboard interrupt. Anywhere you want to catch that keyboard interrupt to stop something in progress uh, that's the process, of, some process is uh, active, you want to stop it, that keyboard interrupt can do that. So again, 
and I can't stress this enough, that error handling is not a remedy. It's not a solution for syntax errors and logical errors. The programmer needs to fix those. What the error handling is useful for or is useful for is handling those kind of exceptional situations that can arise because of some outside thing that we trusted. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, you should be making progress on your um, pro or project uh, as you work through that. Uh, remember, if you have questions uh, about anything, about today's uh, kind of content, post it in the comments section. If you have other questions, send me an email. Uh, there's also a discussion form on the course site. Post stuff on there. Uh, post questions, and I'll answer them uh, relatively quickly. If you need any other help with anything, send me an email. Send me a text message. Uh, give me a phone call. I'm always here to answer things. So let me know. And that's it for today.